Welcome to the Weekly Trend, a podcast for navigating the markets through the lens of technical analysis. The Weekly Trend podcast is provided for educational purposes only and does not constitute any professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the information or content without first seeking advice from a registered financial planner. Welcome back to the Weekly Trend podcast. Today is Friday, December 15th, 2023. S&P 500 currently sitting at 4706. I'm David Zarling. I'm running solo today. Ian is on vacation. Kevin is working on another project. So you guys have to sit here and listen to my voice. I don't like listening to it either, so I will make this brief. But I thought it was important to provide you guys, both our clients and our listeners, an update regarding the market developments from this week. And what we saw was breath expansion. Plain and simple, we saw more stocks participating to the upside. And that's important information confirming what we saw going back to late October, early November, where we saw a breath washout. So panic selling followed by panic buying, which resulted in what's called a Zwig breath thrust. And that was information that a potential new marathon race was upon us. Information that the bear market that had been in place going back to February 2021 for the majority of stocks. I'm not saying all stocks, stocks. I'm not saying the large cap stocks. I'm not saying the S&P 500. But when you look underneath the surface, the things that were happening since February of 2021, so many stocks, so many of the high-flying stocks had been in corrective phase. And we might be coming out of that on a breath expansion perspective. I'm not saying that the bull market is starting now. It's likely confirmed that it started back in June based on being above 4180 and a rising 200-day moving average for something like this and P500. But the health of the market was narrow. It was large cap led, perfectly normal. And now what we saw this week was confirmation that we might be seeing a broad expansion of more stocks participating the upside. Case in point, when we look at the New York Stock Exchange and look at up the percentage of stocks moving to the upside versus downside, we saw 90% upside Uh, volume uh, on Wednesday, followed by 80% on Thursday. That is confirmation of breath expansion for the overall market. And we want to pay attention to that. When we have more and more stocks participating to the upside, that is a quality characteristic. It doesn't have to stay that way, but you may recall in our previous episodes, just talking about something like the Russell 2000, right? On, On the one hand, you have the S&P 500 nearing levels close to an all-time high. Not yet, yet, not yet. But we've had Russell 2000 correct almost 30% since 2021, and it's now reached a level that's still 17% below its highs. And we're up against this really important horizontal level in something like the Russell 2000 near the 198, 200 level using something like IWM. We moved pretty fast and furious this week to reach that level. And sometimes it's about the energy that's been expended to get to this point. However, it's also worth highlighting that we've been in this 20% range in the S&P or 20% range in the small caps using the Russell 2000 since April of 2022. And that that's a pretty long time for something to be moving sideways. And I, I don't want to make it sound extraordinary. I'm just saying, that's a long range. It's a deep, it's the depth of the range is also large. If we break higher out of this, that would be further confirmation that this bull leg higher has legs for sure. When we look at this past week, a good technician, his name, Steve Straza shared that 44% of S and P 500 stocks reached an overbought reading on something called relative strength index overbought being greater than 70%. Now, I will throw in a little caveat there because many people listening to this might think, what do you mean overbought? Like, that sounds like a bad thing, overbought. The way to think about that, though, is overwhelming demand. There was so much demand in the market that it cost 44% of S&P 500 stocks to have a reading on RSI above 70%. It's another way of measuring breath, another way of measuring people just climbing over themselves to try to buy stocks. We haven't seen something like this since June of 2003, which was coming out of a bottom of a bear market into a new bull that went on all the way into 2007. In June of 2020, so coming off the COVID lows, we saw this type of move. So overwhelming demand for stocks. 
And that market moved much higher from there. And I should highlight at this point that 77% of stocks in the S&P 500 are above a 200-day moving average. That's a quality characteristic. And the argument would also be added that the 200-day moving averages are rising. So 77% of stocks in the S&P are above rising 200-day moving averages. A rising 200-day moving average, by definition, is an uptrend. So we have 77% of stocks in an uptrend. And before you get carried away with, oh, he mentioned overbought, that might be bad, those type of things. When we look at like bullish percent, so the New York Stock Exchange bullish percent, those things that are on a buy signal, we're only at 60% on something like that. And what does that mean to you? Like, that's not a number you deal with on a daily basis. Here's what it means. It's very similar to a team on the football field that's winning, has the ball, and is at midfield. That simply means that this bull market does not have to be over. If that bullish percent was sitting up in the 80s or 90 percent, that would be something worth paying attention to because typically that indicator is at that position after we've seen a move in those things underneath the surface and you start talking about high flyers. We're not talking about high flyers at this point. We're talking about the previous high flyers that went into 80 to 90% corrections that are now building these massive bases. An example of this would be initial public offerings, IPOs. Why do these type of, why do IPOs exist, right? We think about capital markets. What are they for? They're for capital. They're for companies to go out, issue stock, issue credit, receive those funds, grow their business so they can serve more people. They're typically a higher risk endeavor. IPOs corrected close to 70% going back to February of 2021 into December of 2023. And that's a big picture I want to highlight is think about that period of time. The majority of stocks correct in 21, 2021 through 2023. Not all stocks, right? We're very familiar with S&P 500. We're very familiar with the NASDAQ 100. Those have those large cap names in them. Those did correct, but that was only from the beginning of 22 for about nine months from the beginning of 23 into October of 23. So the majority of stocks, it's been much longer for your bigger cap names like a Microsoft or an Apple. It wasn't really till the beginning of 22 into October of 22 that they had their corrective period. So large cap stocks correction for about nine months. A lot of stocks underneath the surface was really from February of 21 through the final part of 22. 23 has seen a mixture, still pretty narrow for most of 23. 2023, you've continued to see large cap, but this last week could have signaled the potential for what's called a catch-up trade, where we see things like small caps, where we see things like IPOs, where we see things like ARK Invest is another one, where we see those things catch up, move higher, and catch up to the larger cap names. The way we would know that that's officially underway is the fast move in small caps this week up into the 198, 200 level on IWM. We would want to see that level cleared. That's an important area for the market when we look at things like the Russell 2000. It's sitting at that area right now. And and the reason why that's important is if I can re-highlight the range that existed in small caps going back to April of 2022, it's a 20% range. Through now, so if you think about that, we're you know we're sitting on a year and a half worth of a range that's about twenty percent in size, and we moved pretty quickly the last few weeks. In fact, I believe it's the fastest from a fifty-two week low to a fifty-two week high that we've seen in small caps on record. So a very rapid move from the end of October of this year through now into a horizontal level near one ninety-eight two hundred on IWM. It is very logical that we would digest here in the next week or so. However, we've seen other indices that have cut through horizontal potential horizontal resistance, meaning where sellers have shown up in the past but moved quickly through there like a hot knife through butter. So does that happen in the coming weeks? That's to be determined. Would be perfectly normal to see small caps pause here near the 198-200 level. This would be very similar to the 4180 level on S&P 500 that we highlighted many, many times in the past that we've since cleared and moved much higher in the S&P 500. For small caps, it's the same thing. And that's important information. It's We want to know 
are we having breadth expansion or is it back to just owning the large caps? Time will tell. This week was a very important week for highlighting the potential for what we would consider a return to a correlation of one, a broadening out of the market heading into 2024. Like when we look at 2023, pretty big dispersion. You had certain other markets that did very, very well and basically carry the market while everything else lagged underneath the surface. But now you're in an environment where you could see a broadening out, and that would be important to see and identify and be aware of. That's why we use our adaptive process is to look at each of these charts, each of these indices, each of these sectors internationally, you name it, to go through the process of identifying where is the strength. And what's interesting is when you do the work and you look at the individual stocks underneath the surface, the amount of stocks that are building what's called a base that is 12 to 18 months in length, that if we break higher, this could only just be the start of a bull market higher. And I don't want to make it sound like just sunshine and rainbows, but we continue to see the things that we highlighted in the past confirm. You might recall a couple episodes ago talking about how the table was set for the market to move higher because of the washout that happened in the end of October with the Zwig bar thrust and rapid expansion at the beginning of November. Well, all we've seen is confirmation. We haven't seen pullbacks. We're starting to see that sentiment about, oh man, I hope there's a pullback so that I can get involved. There may be no pullbacks. Now, it would make sense based on the move we saw this week into horizontal levels for a couple indices to see a pause this week and then a melt up higher going into Christmas, but time will tell. But we do know that the Dow Jones above 37,000 and it's it's the first major indice to reach an all-time high, that is not bearish to be at an all-time high. When we see things like tech and semiconductors both making new all-time highs, that is not bearish information. When we see high beta stocks versus low volatility stocks moving higher and breaking above important ranges, that is not bearish behavior. When we see a rate of trend change for emerging markets that goes back decades, you know, when we're talking about a rate of change that goes back, here's February 2021 again, but what I mean by decades is emerging markets using EM hasn't moved anywhere. It's the same spot it was in April of 2007. It is currently sitting at $40 using EEM as a proxy. The highs are near $50 to $55 in EEM. We just now broke the rate of trend that goes back to February 21. That is important information. That's risk-taking behavior to take on more emerging market exposure. Same thing with microcaps. We saw microcaps have a false breakdown in October, have quickly moved higher. They're at an important rate of trend. We'll see if it can break it. But we are seeing things that continue to highlight that it is a risk-on environment that is not overbought in the sense of participation. There are some things that are just getting started. Does that continue? Time will tell. You know, if we can't reclaim 198.200 on IWM, that's information. But as long as we've got a VIX that's falling below 13, and we've got triple C credit spreads, which is a measure of liquidity, falling off and cooling off, and we see things like semiconductors and tech, and now you're seeing banks and biotech and home builders moving higher. These are really, some of these are cyclical. Some of these are risk-taking stocks. We are seeing the gambit of investors, institutions falling over themselves to reclaim, to buy these assets back. Now, that's this is about as bullish as we've sounded, but when we think about the information that's going on underneath the surface, I think it's worth highlighting. And so we want to be aware of what would be the opposite. Well, I think we could look at small caps and if they can't reclaim 128, or I'm sorry, 198, 200, that would be a little problematic. If something like the New York Stock Exchange was back below 16,000, that would be problematic. If you saw banks using something like BKX back below $89, that would be a problem. If the VIX is rallying back above $16, that would be problematic. If you saw the dollar, right? We How many times have we talked about the dollar on here, a weaker dollar helping equities? If the dollar's back above 105, that would be a problem. If we've got you know gold, which is, and I don't even know if this would be a problem. What's interesting about gold from this last week is that it had such a sell-off the prior week, it now rebounded this week a bit and is still sitting up close to that very important 2000 level. We'll see if there's any follow-through there. 
But as far as red flags, it would really come from something like small caps not being able to get above 200. It would be things like the end of December. So from a seasonal perspective, when we talk about the Santa Claus rally being the last five days of the year and the first two of the next year, if we're not able to be positive at that point, if January of next year is negative, when it typically is positive, these would be warning signs that we would start to be wanting to pay attention to. So as always with technical analysis, we want to adapt. We want to be able to adapt to our environment and the information that's being provided. And right now, the information continues to support the thesis. And because isn't that what we operate under anyway, is we have a thesis and either the information is supporting that or it's refuting that because no one knows the future. I know like the major financial news networks, maybe some of your shills out there want to push this idea that they know the future. No one knows the future, but the God almighty. And so here we operate on our thesis and the information continues to support a higher uh, equity prices, you know, six to 12 months out from here thesis that all gets wiped out if it's refuted by quite simply prices not being able to clear important areas. You know, the NASDAQ 100 is currently, you know, sitting at a level that's right at its prior highs in December of 2021, in January 2022, at the 405 level. If it gets rejected there and it can't reclaim, if small caps can't get above 198, 200, that would be information where, hey, hold on, maybe something isn't right here. It's never a 100% guaranteed prospect. It's about managing risk when a risk becomes apparent. It's about being involved when in the uptrend when the uptrend is apparent. Right now, there's uptrends all around us with the information that some of the participation may just be getting started. So it's going to be a really interesting uh, next few months, right? The best six months out of a 12-month period is November, December, January, February, March, and April. We typically see weakness in in February during that time. That would be perfectly normal. But we're in mid-December. What do we see through the end of the year? What do we see in January? That would be tremendous information to keep in line. I didn't even talk about bonds. You know, when we look at something like treasuries, and we continue to see rates move lower. That's information too. When equities have an environment where rates are stabilizing, they're not moving in one direction or the other in a crazy manner, an unknown manner, that helps these companies manage cash flow when they don't have to be worrying about the interest rate risk. So if we just have a stabilization in interest rates, we continue to see what we would call a weak dollar. There's nothing uh, crazy there from a perspective that we see a trade weight of dollar using DXY below a 200-day moving average. You know, when we look at commodities as a whole, that's something, you know, we want to pay attention to. But specifically, when we look at gold still back above that 2000 level, that's important. When we look at the probably the largest commodity out there, oil still below a 200-day moving average, still declining going back to September of this year. Does that rebound? Time will tell. But right now, we continue to see confirmation of more stocks participating to the upside, and that's a good thing. And while that's happening, you have the Dow Jones, which is highly correlated to the S&P 500 going out at all-time highs. You have tech going out at all-time highs. You have semiconductors going at all-time highs. The information continues to support what we were highlighting back at the end of October, early November, a flush, a broadening out. And that continues to be what we see. So really no change from that perspective. At this time, I want to highlight the supporter of this podcast, Adaptive Select ETF, ADPV listed on the NYSE, which helps investors access two of the most prevalent factors in markets, momentum and relative strength. Through proprietary identification methods, the Adaptive Select ETF attempts to own the strongest 25 large cap stocks when the market is in an uptrend. And since not all market environments are the same. Adaptive selects to prevent extended declines by moving to short-term treasury bills and cash during long-term market downtrends. Investors can find out more, including how to invest in ADPV by visiting adpvetf.com or calling 1-833-880-5200. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal distributed by Quasar Distributors, LLC. I appreciate everyone hanging out with me. I know it's not as exciting as when we have two individuals on here. So thanks for, for listening and tuning in. If you appreciate the information that we provide, please give us the highest ranking on your platform of choice and share it with your friends. We would love it. Have a great weekend.